This is Chasing the Horizon, a podcast by, for, and about motorcyclists, brought to you by the BMW Motorcycle Owners of America and Web Bike World. Welcome to episode 127. I'm your host, Wes Fleming, and our guest this time is Sean McLean, Products and Accessories Manager for BMW Motorrad USA. Welcome to 2022, and here we are, back at it after a little hiatus. We'll kick things off with news about the state of the motorcycle industry. Sales rose in a number of markets in 2021, which is good news for all of us. In the UK and Australia especially, 21 was a particularly successful year. Motorcycle and scooter sales rose almost 10% in Great Britain to just over 114,000 units. Adventure bikes were the biggest gainers there, with nearly 20% growth over 2020, and they represented almost 20% of total unit sales there. In Australia, however, adventure and other off-road bikes represented a whopping 56% of total motorcycle sales. Total motorcycle sales in Australia saw a 7% increase over 2020, with scooter sales rising 8%, despite only representing about 4% of the motorcycle and off-highway vehicle segment. Sales of Japanese marks were similarly up, despite ongoing concerns about the availability of the ever-important computer chips and increasingly important magnesium, both of which are critical to the production of motorcycles and other motorized vehicles all over the world. Japanese builders delivered over 233,000 motorcycles domestically from January through November 2021, nearly a 21% increase over the same period in 2020. December was expected to add another 3,000 bikes to the total, and please note that this is just inside Japan. It marks their most successful year in motorcycle sales since 1998. Interestingly, Japan's numbers get into demographics as well, and it seems more young folks are getting out on two wheels than ever before, especially on scooters. BMW had a banner year as well, with worldwide sales rising 15% to just over 194,000 motorcycles and scooters. As you might expect, BMW had Germany to thank for being its biggest market, and Germany contributed uh, contributed over 13% of BMW's total sales, even though that represents a nearly 6% drop in sales compared to 2020 for just Germany. Sales everywhere else in the world went up for BMW, including mid-teens increases in France, Italy, and Spain. The real winners for BMW in 2021 were the United States and the United Kingdom, where sales rose 32% and 27% respectively. China bought 21% more BMW motorcycles in 2021, putting them in third place on the increased sales podium charts. Over 30% of BMW's sales were GS and GS Adventure models, firmly cementing what BMW calls Enduro Adventure Bikes as BMW's top sellers. As an editorial aside here, I remain stunned that France and Italy, which combined have a population of less than 40% that of the United States, but France and Italy continue to purchase more BMW motorcycles than in the U.S., The U.S. got close to beating Italy this year, and as a matter of fact, Italians bought just four more BMW motorcycles than U.S. riders. But come on. Maybe it's that two-wheel culture is more deeply embedded in Europe's basic transportation mindset, while in the U.S., riders are less interested in riding every day and seem to focus more on occasional travel and weekend trips. Either way, as an unashamed BMW fan, y'all have to know I'm happy to see such a big increase in U.S. sales. So let's keep it up, folks. At the very least, let's beat Italy in 2022 and move the U.S. into third place in BMW's motorcycle market list. 
For what it's worth, Harley Davidson hasn't released its sales figures yet for 2021, but I expect them to show an increase in sales over 2020. And of course, I'll bring you that news as soon as it becomes available. Sales figures from Polaris usually focus on revenue and not units sold, so we won't know too much about Indian Motorcycles unit sales for 21. Ducati also had a record year in 2021, selling just over 59,000 motorcycles worldwide to achieve its best sales year in the history of the company. While this is only about 30% of BMW's global sales, it represents a 24% rise in sales for Ducati, which is impressive no matter who you compare it to. Ducati's top-selling model was the Multistrada V4, and they sold about 10,000 of those, representing about 17% of their sales. When it comes to Ducati, the U.S. ruled the roost, claiming 15% of total sales. Top-ranking markets in order after the U.S. were Italy, Germany, China, France, and the U.K. Each of those markets saw marked increases in 21, with the U.S. and U.K. leading the pack with 32 and 30% rises, respectively. Australia sales saw a 50% rise to just over 2,000 Ducatis sold there. The CEO of Ducati's North American division, Jason Chinock, said in this clarified quote, I think the pandemic has shook the cobwebs out of a handful of people where they decided, if this is the way the new reality is going to be, I'm getting out there and living, un sort of quote. As we all know, there is no better way to get out and live than on a motorcycle. Chinock went on to cite a figure I hadn't seen anywhere else, and that is that motorcycle sales in general rose because the industry enjoyed a 19% increase in returning motorcyclists. That is, riders who quit riding for a number of years for whatever reason and then got back into it in 2021. Now that is an encouraging number. Electricity, 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 electricity. Nearly in the same breath as BMW's announcement of their record sales for 2021 came the corporate announcement that the company will be well on its way to abandoning internal combustion in the next decade. Yes, their move to an all-electric future includes, as far as we know, motorcycles. Their plan sounds straightforward. BMW intends to double electric vehicle sales between 2021 and 2022 and sell 2 million EVs by 23, which would include hybrids, and then sell 2 million fully electric vehicles by 25, and then have half of all BMW sales be fully electric vehicles by 2030. By 2032, BMW expects to have delivered 10 million fully electric vehicles. This shines a brighter light on the subject discussed by this episode's guest, the fully electric BMW CE04, BMW's newest two-wheel model. It will be an interesting future, no matter how you feel about electric vehicles right now. Now, in a move I found a little surprising, Ducati has finally unveiled its first all-electric race bike, which if you've been listening regularly, you know they are on the hook for to supply the MotoGP spin-off Moto E series for the 2023 season. The prototype is called the V21L, and it was run on the track by Michelle Piro, a veteran Ducati test rider. Piro said, quote, The bike is light and already has good balance. Furthermore, the throttle connection in the first opening phase and the ergonomics are very similar to those of a MotoGP bike. If it weren't for the silence and the fact that in this test, we decided to limit the power output to just 70% of performance, I could easily have imagined that I was riding my bike. From an experienced rider of MotoGP bikes, that is indeed high praise, and I for one will be proud to be proven wrong in my predictions that Ducati would fail to deliver a MotoGP quality electric race bike on the aggressive deadline they committed to. Interestingly, on the heels of this, KTM CEO Stefan Purer more or less dissed electric motorcycles at the MotoGP level, saying, and I quote, 
Until 2035, I see no replacement for the combustion engine in GP Sport, unquote. He had a lot to say about it, some of it even sort of positive. Check out the article on Web Bike World using the link on the show notes page on the Chasing the Horizon website for this episode. Now, the first ever electric motorcycle featuring carbon fiber wheels has made its debut thanks to a Taiwan-based company called Graft. Not the best business name if you ask me, but its founder, Azizi Tucker, has previously worked at NASA and Tesla, so you know the technology's there, even if the business name is Graft. The EO12 weighs just 110 pounds. It boasts IP67 waterproofness and allegedly has a permanently lubricated chain. Of course, if you go dunking it in water to test the IP67 waterproofness, you're liable to mess up the permanently lubricated chain. The heart of the dedicated off-road bike is its interchangeable battery system, which will be compatible with Graft's other EVs. While no distance estimates were made, the battery pushes peak power at 20 kilowatts, which creates a claimed 323 foot-pounds of torque at the rear wheel. The bike's lightweight, and no doubt it's high cost, will come from the carbon fiber wheels, a 3D printed titanium drivetrain, and its aircraft grade CNC machined, super high tech aluminum frame. Joining me on this episode of Chasing the Horizon is Sean McLean, who is a products and accessories manager with BMW Motorrad. Sean, welcome to Chasing the Horizon. I'm glad to be here, Wes. My yeah, pleasure. And, you know, you're you're my first official person from BMW in over 125 episodes. Uh, I have not asked anybody from BMW to be on the show because, uh, you know, I kind of, even though there's a BMW focus... Um, in general, just because of my life, uh, I've tried not to hammer people over the head with, uh, with BMW too much. Um, but, uh, as, as you can probably guess, it's almost unavoidable. The more people I talk to, the more fans of BMW I find. Um, so it's great to finally have somebody from BMW on the show. I appreciate you coming, man. And I- I'm really happy to be here. You know, I- there was a long time when, huh. You know, I, 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 let me say this. I, I think BMW to many people is this sort of entity. And really, you know, it's just a bunch of people. It, it, it's just uh, uh, normal people here. We've got people in the United States. Obviously, we've got the dealers. And to many of our riders, the dealer is BMW. And, and that's very much the case. Those guys are on the front lines and, yeah. and doing a, a great job for us and trying to give the customers the best experience possible. So, uh we're just a bunch of people. We are, we're a lean, mean machine. We're trying to do the best we can, provide some awesome products, and provide the customers great experiences. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I invited you on the show to talk about one specific product that I'm, I'm kind of interested in, and that's the CEO4, the new electric motorcycle, uh, which I guess some people would call a scooter. Um, <laughs> you know, it just kind of depends on your perspective. Um, but before we get there, I would like to talk to you a little bit about how you got into motorcycles in the first place. Uh, well, I would say your timing is is quite apropos. And the reason I say that is this Christmas will be my 50th anniversary riding. Wow. Congratulations. Um, when I was, uh, well, I'm, I'm Thank you. I'm 58 now. And when I was eight years old, uh, after bugging the crap out of my parents for who knows how long, uh, they bought me my first motorized two-wheel vehicle. And I say that as opposed to motorcycle because I wouldn't quite call it a motorcycle. It was, you know, what we typically call a mini bike with sort of one of those lawnmower engines and centrifugal clutches. And my parents at the time bought it from... Uh, for those people that, that have been around as long as I have, they may remember from a J.C. Penney Auto Center. Nice. <laughs> yes. Nice. That's awesome. So uh, for starting from eight years old, did you from there, did you get into dirt bikes or did you, you know, like 10 oh, years later, you got your first street bike, that kind of thing? Uh, three years later, when I was 11, my father bought me and I 
said my, I should say my parents, because they were both in on it. And uh, Lord knows why, I guess because I bugged them and they saw that I had a genuine passion for it because they were not motorcyclists by any means. Oh, okay. uh, but I, I thank them to this day for being open to it and allowing me to ride. And I have to say, even back then, when I was eight years old, when no one heard of ATGAT, my father, not even being a rider, he laid down certain rules. If I was going to ride, I'd have boots on. I had to have gloves on. I had to have some protective gear. So I really appreciate that. Nice. Uh, but back to your question. Um, when I, that three years later, when I was 11, um, my parents bought me a Honda XL125. Uh, the thought being that I was too young to ride on the street. Um, although I did occasionally, and at one point had my motorcycle confiscated by the police, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, but, but the thinking was, you know, I could do my off-road riding that I would love to do. And then if I kept it long enough, it was street legal. So I could ride it on the road once I got my license, which I did do. I had that bike for many years. Cool. Cool. So I, I assume that these days you're probably riding a BMW of some sort. I am indeed. What do you, what do you take out when the, when the mood strikes you? Well, I, I, uh, I have to say I'm in a very fortunate position where, um, I get that the company provides me with a motorcycle to ride and it's not always, you know, it's, it's not like thing where I can ride whatever I want, whenever I want. Um, but uh, it's often a, a very, uh, you know, a case of it, it's, it's just a great, position to be in. I have to yeah. say it's a great benefit from the company. Um, I rode to work this morning. I'm currently riding a 2022 R18 transcontinental. Um, I live in New York state. Uh, BMW's headquarters are in Northern New Jersey. So I do ride 12 months out of the year. So this time of year, I like to get something with uh, good weather protection, a heated seat and heated grips. Yeah. That's and, gotta be nice. Yeah. So it, it's a perfect bi bike right now. Um, I have a number of personal bikes that I own, most of which are vintage bikes. And I love all the new bikes. I love when it rains and I'm pulling out of the parking lot in the evening and I just hit the button that says rain. Yeah. And I love that. But I also love to go home and play with carburetors and ignition timing and things like that. Uh, that uh, that says to me that you probably have some airheads in that garage. Yes, I do indeed. <laughs> a number of them. Yes. Yeah, because you know the 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 other side of the uh, of the aisle when it comes to BMW motorcycles is the K bikes, which uh, from the very beginning have all had uh, fuel injection. So if you're tinkering with carburetors, you're you're not on a K bike. <laughs> you're right about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really cool. Um, tell me a little bit about um, your impressions of the Transcontinental. Um, I've ridden the I've ridden three of the four versions I've ridden the first edition, you know, kind of the base model. Uh, I wrote a classic and I wrote a bagger, but I haven't yet had a chance to ride a transcon. So I'm curious how, what, uh, what are your impressions of that bike? Well, I would say, well, I mean, with, with your experience, not only riding various R18s, but also with your history of riding BMWs, you probably went through a similar thing that I did was when I first rode an R18 it, you have to put everything you know about BMW aside. It is not the typical BMW. You don't ride it like a typical BMW. Yeah. But when I recalibrated my sort of way of riding, it, it just, then it started to make sense to me. And uh, it's the transcontinental. It's, I love the fact that it's got that big fairing on, particularly this time of year when the yeah. weather you know, it turns a bit cooler. Um, I enjoy listening to satellite radio. It is, it, the motor is so long legged. Um, and you can just, you know, you can cruise at this thing at 80 miles an hour if you want, and you're not even touching 3000 RPMs. It's yeah. wonderful. And, and for those of you that, that are familiar with, well, I would say with boxers in general, it doesn't have to be an area. Any boxer, uh, can be, incredibly smooth or if just the slightest thing is not quite right it can be uh quite, quite a bit of an animal to handle and i have to <laughs> say this massive 1800 cc motor is so glass smooth when you get that thing up and cruising it, it's a wonderful thing now having said all that the bike is big 
It's heavy. Yeah. It's big. But boy, you get that thing moving down the highway and it is awesome. Yeah, you're absolutely right about the kind of recalibrating your your mind to it. Um, I, well, the thing that that I that I kind of that really made me pay attention to that recalibration was the the wheelbase. Um, because I typically ride uh, an R1200 GS, a, a water-cooled R1200 GS, which has a, a shorter wheelbase than the R18. Yeah. And I noticed that I was, uh, at first, when I first started riding, and I was going wide in my turns. <laughs> and uh, I had to kind of, you know, settle down and think about what I was doing and kind of change my, like you were saying, recalibrate. You know, it's like, okay, now I got it. And once I figured that out, man, even going through sweepers on that thing was just uh, an absolute joy. And, Absolute uh, joy, and, and if you've—I don't know if you've noticed it since you've ridden an R18B, the R18B and the R18 Transcontinental have the same chassis and front end, right? But they're different from the R18 and R18 Classic, and and then the bigger bikes, what they did, they actually steepened up the 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 rake on those bikes, so the, the slow speed handling. Uh, is a bit easier, but the way the triple clamps are, it's sort of a reverse triple clamp. So you actually get more trail out of it. So you can, oh, cool. you this wonderful combination of high speed stability, but parking lot maneuverability. It's really, really nice what they did with it. That's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's one of the, one of the, not to, not to keep continue on the, uh, the R18, uh, love thread, but one of the things that I thought was really cool about it, and that speaks highly to to what you just said is how bmw made such an effort to make the bike as technologically advanced as possible but to look as retro as possible like all of the there's no you can't see any there's no black boxes there's no sensors there's no unnecessary cables or hoses or wires sticking out for you to see it's just so um clean when you look at it that, you know, you can't even see the oxygen sensors, you know, that kind of thing. It, and it just speaks yeah, really highly, yeah. I think, to the level of engineering that went into the design process. And to even think about that kind of process to flip the triple clamp around so that, you know, you get that that combination of high speed stability and low speed maneuverability is it just shows that that, you know, people are thinking about what the rider experience is. Absolutely. And, you know, I have to say when, uh, the first time my wife saw one of the R 18s in the garage and believe me, she's, she's seen a few bikes in the garage before, <laughs> but she saw the R 18 and e even she said, wow, you know, that that's clearly a new BMW, but it looks like one of your old ones. Um, so, you know, she put two and two together. Other people I've run into say, boy, that's, uh, that's, you know, that's clearly a new bike, but it really has a lot of vintage touches to it. Yeah. And uh, the people that see this bike, whether they're BMW people or not BMW people, or maybe one day BMW people across the board, everyone says the fit and finish is absolutely, you know, just first rate, just beautiful bikes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I got, I got nothing to disagree with you on there. Um, but having said all that, I did invite you onto the show because I want to talk about BMW's electric motorcycle, which is the CEO four. Um, and, uh, for people that listen to the show regularly, they know that I always talk about what's going on in the electric motorcycle world, um, in the news segment at the beginning of the show. And I featured some, um, electric motorcycle aficionados and experts and even manufacturers before on the show. Um, but I, I pay attention to be what's going on with BMW probably more closely than anything else. Uh, cause it's my job, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> and so when last year, when they announced the, the concept CEO four, um, I was really intrigued and, and like a lot of people, you know, you're never sure if a concept bike is going to actually move into production because the purpose of a concept bike is to kind of show off technology and gauge interest. So um, I'm really impressed that the concept CEO for, you know, turned into a real motorcycle that BMW is making. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there was a press release not too long ago announcing that it's gone into full production mode now. Is that correct that I'm remembering? 
That is absolutely correct. You know, first thing I'll say is that the, the real thing is, is unbelievably close to the concept. There's really not much difference in it. Uh, we're, we're having the, the and uh, let me back up once, one step here. Sure. And um, the name and, and, and BMW is very particular about this. And I understand why it's CE04. Okay. And the reason I, the reason that's important and, and not to, you know, uh, pick nits here, but the reason that is important is because that communicates. And I say communicate, uh, you have to have people understanding it before you're actually communicating, but <laughs> it, it's supposed to communicate that the bike is a mid size scooter. And the reason it's that is because the O4, if it had an internal combustion motor, it would be approximately 400 cc's. Okay. So that, that kind of gives you a gauge as to uh, the power of the bike and where it sits and compared to other scooters. Um, for the U.S. and for the world, uh, they are in production as we speak. Uh, they'll probably start shipping to the United States. The first one's probably in January. And if all goes well, uh, you'll start seeing them slowly populate in dealers' inventory probably in February. Well, that's, that's the fantastic. plan at this point. Um, production is, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, you're not going to see 10 at each dealership. Um, uh, but right now I have to say we, uh, the interest in dealers and interest from customers is surpassing our initial expectations. So that's really exciting. Uh, we're ramping up our, our production uh, more than what we originally planned. So um, as we get further into spring, I expect more and more of these to be available to customers. So it's, it's very exciting. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so when I looking at the zero four, I, I see a lot of things that are kind of um, kind of mixing the genre between motorcycle and scooter. And I, I'll be the first to admit that I do not know a lot about traditional scooters. Um, it's because I've, I've never really been around them. I don't know that many people that are, are scooter riders. Um, but the, the, it's not a step through. It's not like a, a, a what's now, I can't remember the really famous brand of Italian step Vespa. through Vespa. It's not a Vespa. It yeah. doesn't look like a Vespa, um, you know, that, that has kind of the upright front end, you know, that almost kind of looks like you're, um, I don't want to say it's a sit up and beg position, but it, it has more of an upright you know, front end, it, it's tilted back a little bit more like a motorcycle. Yeah. It's got a, a single uh, canted shock in the back that looks to me a lot like a motorcycle, but then it's got the smaller wheels, more like a scooter. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of curious where, uh, where the design cues come from, like with the R18 that we were talking about, um, it's, it's a lot easier to look back in BMW's lineup and see other motorcycles that look like you can see this kind of thing pulled through to the R18, but with the zero four, it's a little more difficult to identify those characteristics. So I'm just kind of curious if you can speak to the, to the design cues at all. Well, at the risk of speaking for the designers, <laughs> I, w I would say that you really, even the C evolution electric scooter we had a few years ago, it doesn't even really go back to that. Yeah. And I don't think you can really um, say that it goes back to anything or point to certain things and say, well, here's where that has come from and why. And that's okay. This is a very, very forward looking vehicle. You know, it's, it's really, we're not looking back. We're looking completely forward with this. Um, I had a chance to see um, a first uh, pre-series production scooter. That's, that's probably very, very close to being, you know, identical to the production one uh, very recently. And it's, it's of course the natural BMW fit and finish is there, but so many of the design cues, you know, me and a number of colleagues were looking at it and saying, 
I'm not sure why they did that, but boy, it looks cool. I'm not yeah. sure why they did that either, but man, that's cool. It just little textures or little design things here and there. Uh, besides the practicality of this, you know, you have a big storage thing under the seat. A lot of design cues were like, wow, I'm not used to seeing that on a BMW. And just looking at it, it's certainly kind of futuristic looking, but, and I wasn't sure, you know, I've seen it on paper and pictures, but seeing one in person is like, Wow, that that's really pretty cool. That yeah, it's a great it's, job. It's always different to see it in person, um, and, and that's that's one of the things that that I'm excited about. Is I'm I'm excited for my dealer to get one, um, so that I can go see it in person and see, because uh, you know you look at a picture even with a rider on it, um, and and you kind of get an idea how big it might be. But until you stand next to it, you don't really know how high up on your leg does it come? How far do you have to lean forward to, you know, grab the handlebars, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about the, the specs. Um, you know, what kind of performance can a rider expect to get out of a zero four? Um, you know, I've, I've only test ridden a few electric motorcycles, so I don't know a lot about electric motorcycles. So, uh, that's another reason why I wanted to have somebody on the show to talk about an electric motorcycle that's, you know, in production um, to get some of that real world knowledge um, out of them. So what kind of performance if I go sit on if I go ride one, what can I what can I expect? Well, I think with anything, you know, any sort of electric vehicle, the first thing people talk about as far as performance is the torque. Right. Um, it's, it's it'll have 46 pound feet of torque. 42 horsepower, 75 mile an hour top speed, and it'll get an average of 80 miles range. Okay. That's all pretty good. And yeah, what a lot of people I think forget about electric bikes is when they say, you know, it has X equivalent of torque. It has that from the very beginning. You don't have to ramp up to it, you yeah, know, it's because basically it's at, at RPM one. <laughs> yeah. It's there. So that was the the thing that always I always have to once again recalibrate. You know, when you take off on an electric motorcycle, you have to be paying attention immediately to your throttle hand. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've seen some specs, and I can't. They're not at the top of my head right now, but but oftentimes, and I saw this back when we had the Sea Evolution that uh, acceler acceleration wise. Um, for the first, and I forget what the spec is, forgive me, but uh, the first, I don't know, like 50 feet or something like that, it has more acceleration than an S1000RR, something crazy like that. I yeah, mean, that that's really amazing. <laughs> that is that is a little crazy. Um, so the, um, uh, let's talk about the, the range a little bit because um, I think this is another thing that a lot of people who don't ride electric motorcycles can get a little confused about. So just like with um, with a, like with a car that has city mileage and highway mileage, they're going to be a little bit different. When we talk about an electric motorcycle, we talk about you know kind of highway range and and mixed use range where you're and not necessarily stop and go, but you're not going sixty five miles an hour until you're out of battery. Um, right. So and obviously the the harder you ride it. Um, speed wise, the lower that range is going to creep. Um, so do you, do you have any insights into how BMW has tried to balance range with utility? I mean, the, the zero four is not meant to be a touring bike like the R18 transcontinental. It's meant to be kind of a more urban use, um, you know, exactly commuter, yeah. almost commuter style. Very, very much so. Um, and it's it, 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 the, the CE04 has a number of things to sort of aid the rider in getting the maximum amount of range. Um, like most electric vehicles, um, it has recuperative, as BMW calls it, or regenerative power. So okay. oftentimes, you know, when you're rolling off the throttle, you may not even need to use the brakes because it's using the regenerative power uh, to slow down the motor and recharge the battery. Uh, there's always, uh, you can call up on the 10 and a quarter inch TFT screen, a, a, a sort of a balance meter that helps also, you know, how much power are you regenerating? How much power are you using? 
the bike has three modes as standard, one of which is eco. So you're going to get a little softer acceleration and a good amount of regenerative power. Um, you also have rain and, and you also um, have the full mode where you've got all the acceleration and all of the regenerative power, the dynamic mode. So it's always working to regenerate as much power as possible. And you, you made an, uh, an incredibly important point, Wes, where you mentioned that, you know, it, it's, it's not a touring scooter and it's not, it's, this is what BMW puts in its urban mobility uh, segment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, I think about how the world has changed in the last, let's call it 24 months. And I don't work at the office five days a week anymore. I work at the office now on average, I'm, I'm here three days a week now. So there's a couple of days a week where I don't have to come down the New York state Thruway at 80 miles an hour on a 36 mile one way trip. But I still have to run all my errands around town where I live and do things like that. So now a vehicle like this starts to become um, a viable option for me. It may not replace something in my garage, but it can be very complementary to what I have in the garage. Yeah. And um, I was recently at the Long, well, we call it the Long Beach IMS show. It was actually in Costa Mesa this year. And I noticed there were a number of e-bike vendors there. And we've all seen the people on the e-bikes. Um, and I've seen from various ages, whether it's a, a 10 year old kid or a 50 year old gentleman riding an e-bike. And I'm thinking all these young people riding e-bikes, what's the next thing for them? Yeah. You know, it's, they're probably going to want something with a little more power, a little more range, uh, charging is second nature to them. It's just like charging in their e-bike, charging in their phone. It, it's it's all the same. So this is just to me. Wow, this could really be the next thing for a lot of people. It, it's to me. It's you know without trying to sound like I'm just waving the BMW flag. I really <laughs> think this could be sort of the right product at the right time now. And there will be, uh, you know, th this is. This is the second one for us. We had the C Evolution. Now right. we have the C04. There'll be more products down the line. There'll be more products in other segments. But it will take time, and BMW will do it in, in the way that we feel makes sense. It's just about making sense. Right now, it doesn't make sense to make a touring electric motorcycle because the range isn't there or the amount of batteries you would need right. and makes the vehicle too heavy. Right now, internal combustion engines continue to be very powerful, very efficient, cleaner and cleaner each year. So the internal combustion engine still has a lot of life left in it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, as a matter of fact, in the news this morning, um, I saw an article on uh, from Reuters um, that BMW had sold its one millionth EV electric vehicle. Yes. And uh, BMW as a company makes a mix of all electric and uh, hybrid electric vehicles, and they've sold a million of them, uh, which is a, a pretty impressive um, landmark milestone, milestone. Um, so it's clear to me that, you know, for a company that isn't yet known for electric motorcycles, BMW, obviously, as a company has a commitment to electric vehicles. Um, and I'm curious about how that kind of comes through to you guys in on the motorcycle side um, where, you know, because and obviously you can't tell me what's going on behind the curtain, but uh, I'm interested to learn a little bit about the excitement for electric motorcycles from BMW in general when, you know, so much of their business is cars Um you know, it, it, it's easy to overlook the motorcycles because so much of their business is cars. Of course, people like you and me, we're very much into the motorcycles and we're like, they, they sell cars, right? Yes. I heard, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, uh, so I'm kind of curious what, it, what it's like on the, you know, kind of the culture of electric vehicles um, in, in BMW's office. 
it, it's, I think we're all very excited about it. You know, BMW as a, as a group has committed to uh, having 50% of their new vehicle sales being fully electric by 2030. Of course, that's the BMW group. It's not just BMW cars. We also right. own Mini and we also own Rolls Royce. Um, so those three plus the motorcycles are going to contribute to that. Um, so there are certainly more products uh, in the pipeline, some closer, some further away, different segments. I think about, gee, if, you know, if, if we had at some point, and I'm, you know, and uh, we will, you know, you know, I think if we look really, really long term, eventually everything's going to be electric, right? Sooner or later, cars, yeah. sooner or later, you know, it's not going to be 10 years from now, um, but it's going to be a while, but it will happen. And I'm thinking, wow, if, if we had uh, an electric off-road bike, and, and I don't know that we have one any in our pipeline at this point, uh, but if we had one, gee, that might open up a whole different realm of where we could ride. Yeah, there are some places that are just closed down to vehicles. But if it was electric, with little noise, no emissions, the, the possibilities that this opens up are really just things that maybe we haven't even considered at this point. So it, it's it's very exciting. Um, uh, people, when I see the people that both motorcycle people and non motorcycle people that are interested in the CE zero four. Uh, in just, you know, a couple of years ago, it wasn't that common to see electric cars, whether it was a BMW or a Tesla going down the road. And now I see them all the time. You know, yeah. I, I, I bought a new car uh, almost a year ago to the day now. And even when I bought the car last year, I was thinking, you know what, this is probably the last uh, gasoline powered car I'll ever buy. So it's just a matter of time, and, and BMW, is, I think, is approaching it in a very sensible way. Yeah, I know. The uh, the one that I see the most often is the i8, I think it's called. <laughs> yeah, it's um, a very cool-looking car. Yeah, it's very cool-looking, and I see there's there's two or three people um, in, in my, I don't say my neighborhood, but in my city that I see kind of on a regular basis. Um, but the ones that I get excited about are the are the ones that look like full-size cars to me. Um, the I eight is kind of really compact. Um, right. and that's, that's kind of, you know, we're talking about range and, and, uh, one of the things that I, I say quite often is, you know, when, when they come up with an electric motorcycle that gets 400 miles on one charge, I'm in, but I'm not even sure how realistic that is because I can't go 400 miles on my gas powered motorcycle without refueling. <laughs> right, um, right. And, and, you know, f to me, 400 miles is a pretty solid day and the charging technology seems to be improving with every new generation of EVs where it used to be, you know, to get to 80% power, it was four hours. And now to get to 80% power, it's two hours. So how much longer is it going to be before 80% power? You get 80% power in 90 minutes or 75 minutes. And or it, with the CE04, you can go to 20% to 80% power on 220 volts, which everyone has in their house. You yeah. can do that in 45 minutes. 45 you know, minutes, really? While you're, while you're having lunch, you can, yeah. you can charge it up to 80%. Yeah, yeah. and now will, it, will the 04 also charge on a regular like 110 wall outlet? It just Absolutely obviously it would will. take longer. Obviously, it takes a little longer, but yep, you can plug it into your, your outlet, your, you know, your 110 outlet at home as well. Yep. Cool. Uh, yeah. does it you, you brought you brought up an interesting thing when you, you mentioned Wes about the infrastructure. Yeah. And um I'm certainly bullish and excited about electric vehicles, but you know, there it it's it's not just the manufacturers, whether it's a car or a motorcycle or whatever. Um it's gonna take everybody contributing and what i mean by that is yes we need the infrastructure for charging we also need and a couple of things play into this we also need consumer demand yeah you know and they're thinking well i i need a certain amount of range i need to be able to charge it you know or at least not have the anxiety of trying to find a charging place and the other thing that plays into this you know it started off early and it, it's Still a contributing factor is the states and the federal government. A lot of the, you know, whether it's a tax credit or subsidies, 
that's really for a lot of people at this point, sort of a turning point where it's like, okay, now this is starting to make a lot of financial sense when you think about, you know, okay, I don't have to change oil in in my motorcycle anymore. You know, maybe I'm just doing tires and brakes, you know, things like that. It's like, wow. Okay. No more valve adjustments. Okay. This is starting to make a lot of sense to me now. (laughs) You're starting to sound like a crazy man there, Sean. No, no. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know how I would uh, adapt to a motorcycle that needs no maintenance, you know, (laughs) brake pads and tires and, and, you know, make sure that there's no rocks in the drive belt and, and go, Um, go. I'm, I'm so used to, to working on my own bikes that, uh, yeah, I don't even know how to process that to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> that makes, you know, that's another thing that contributes to a lot of people saying, okay, all that. I mean, just, uh, you know, you don't have to go to your dealership and, you know, schedule a, a two or a four hour service. It's, it's just, wow. And really, it really changes your dynamic of how you live with the vehicles that you have. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, another thing I'm kind of interested in, and uh, you might not actually be the right person to ask this question to, but you also might know something about it. Um, So obviously anytime a new model comes out, the technical staff, you know, the mechanics and the technicians that are at the dealerships have to have to get trained up on it. But when it's something that resembles what they're used to working on, it's, it's details and differences rather than, you know, new systems. Yeah. With something like the zero four, you've got a completely new platform. You've got a completely new concept and, you know, tires are tires and brake pads are brake pads, but what kind of um, commitment does BMW need from its dealers to get those techs trained up on a completely new piece of technology? What's that process look like? Well, for something like a, a new technology, you know, in this case, you know, electrified vehicles, there, there's a, there's more of a commitment than usual because like any new vehicle, you may have new special tools, you may right. have new training, things like that. But now when, when you're dealing with electricity and, and high voltage electricity, well, you know, let's be very clear and let's be very honest here. Someone can get hurt if they don't know what they're doing. Yes. So there's there's serious training that that needs to happen. And this is one reason why we are not going to flood the market with a bunch of CE04s at first. We want to make sure that the dealers are properly trained, both from a salespeople that know how to explain it and, and do a proper handover to a customer so the customers have a great experience, but also for the technicians that need to work on it. You know, the first thing, and we, we learned a lot of this stuff when we did the C evolution. You know, first thing a technician has to do is define electrical problem. Is it low voltage where maybe I just have something with the battery or I've got a headlight out or do we have a high voltage problem? Once that determination is made, if it's a high voltage problem, certain protocols go into place. You have to make certain safety uh, adjustments to the vehicle. Uh, Sometimes you even have to, you know, you should, a technician should cordon off the vehicle so someone doesn't get doesn't get too close to it and maybe touches something they shouldn't be touching. BMW Motorrad USA, the, the United States um, arm of BMW in Germany, we're committed to helping the dealers to not only get them properly trained, but help them in, in uh, you know, the cost of the special tools. Special tools are not cheap. Training is not cheap. You know, when, when a dealer has one of their technician uh, when they send them, you know, to, to training, well, the technician's not in the store anymore generating profit for the dealership. The dealership has the expense of the travel time, the hotels, the meals. It's very costly for the dealers to have somebody out of training, but of yeah. course it's ultimately so important and it just, you know, it helps the customer experience. It helps the, the, the dealership to be up on the latest technology. So it's, it, it takes everybody working together. Yeah, that's a really good, really good point. I didn't even think of that, that, you know, when a, uh, when a dealership takes a tra- technician and sends them to training, they're not at the shop fixing motorcycles. Yeah. 
you know, I, I kind of spaced on that, uh, to be perfectly honest. I didn't think of that. That's got to be a real burden on the dealers. And, you know, I, I, there was a time when, when I worked at a dealership. So I have a lot of, I have a soft spot in my heart for dealerships, not only the, on the front lines for us every day with the customers, uh, but I was there and it's, it's a tough business. And, I really, you know, I can't stress enough to the people the importance of supporting your local dealer. You want them to be there for you. So, you know, yeah, you can buy your parts online. And I know a lot of people love to tinker with their bikes, and I do too. Uh, and they're, that's fine. That's fine. Um, just support them if you can. Support your local dealerships. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of the local dealerships. And I, um, I, I, get my parts from a BMW dealership that's right up the road. Um, and the main reason is because I know they're going to ask me, they're, they're, they're always going to be interested in what I'm doing. And like, for instance, once upon a time I had to replace my brake discs. And uh, so I, I got new brake pads and I got new brake discs and the guy was like, did you know that the bolts that secure the brake discs are specced as single use only? And I was like, no, I was going to pull them out and put them back in, you know, clean them off and put them back in. <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 you know, you need to get a set of those bolts because the safety specs say you should, you should replace those bolts when you pull them out. Totally made sense. And now I know to tell people when they talk about changing their brake discs, yeah. I know to say, hey, make sure you get a full set of bolts because those are single use only. Um, yep. And if I had just gone online somewhere, and this is certainly not to disparage folks that sell parts online, more power to them. Absolutely. But, but having that relationship with your dealer, no matter what brand you ride, is always going to be to your benefit, even if it costs you a couple of dollars more in the moment. You mentioned the, the optimal word there, relationship. Having that relationship with those people at the dealership. That that's the key thing, you know, yeah. you're there to support them and they in turn support you and giving you the knowledge like that, not just selling someone uh, a couple of rotors and, and hope for the best. No, <laughs> they take the extra time, talk to you about your motorcycle, talk to you about what you're doing, give you some hints on the ways to do it right. It's great. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And you know, I'm curious about something else. It's, it's a little bit off topic from the zero four, but I'm kind of curious how you came into the BMW orbit. You said you used to work at a dealership um, and obviously you've been into motorcycles from a very young age. So I'm sure as you were growing up, you thought, Hey, I could, I could work in motorcycles, but uh, how did all that happen? Actually, you know, I, I didn't think that I could work in motorcycles when really? I was growing up. I wish I did. It never occurred to me that <laughs> motorcycles could be a career. Never did. Um, but, but how I got into the BMW orbit is that I had, I was actually in the music industry, believe it or not. No kidding. In, in Nashville, Tennessee. And I had moved there out of college, went there to be in the music industry, uh, in the, in the, uh, the back end of things as a recording engineer. Um, but always doing motorcycles. That never left me. I was always involved with motorcycles, riding, tinkering, blah, blah, blah. And well, I found myself after about 10 years of that, um, I found myself getting a little burned out with the music industry. And I found that um, you had very long days, which I don't have a problem with long days, but I would go to the studio at about eight in the morning. I'd come home at 10 at night. And then I would work oftentimes in the kitchen of my townhouse, rebuilding a motorcycle from 10 PM till 2 AM. And I figured I better get some sleep because I got to yeah. go back to the studio at eight. So this went round and round for a few years. And I said, you know what? I, I think I really want to pursue this motorcycle thing. And I, I, I have to say it was maybe the most empowering thing I've ever done in my life where I, I actually set myself a goal, which was, believe it or not, I wanted to be a, I didn't know what to call it back then. I didn't know if it, what the name was for it, but I wanted to be the liaison between BMW because I was riding BMWs by that time and the dealerships. 
And I, uh, and maybe this can work. It worked for me. Maybe it can work for other people. Maybe it can help them some way, but I knew where I wanted to go. I just had to plot a path of how to get there. Right. So I sort of worked my way backwards. If I want to get the BMW, maybe I can get there from a dealership. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know how else to get there. Maybe I could do that. Well, how do I get to a dealership? Well, I seem to enjoy and have a bit of an aptitude for working on motorcycles. So maybe I could be a technician. Okay. How do I be a technician? Well, uh, there's technician schools. Okay. So I need to go to technician school. So I quit my job. I locked up my house and went to technician school for six or eight months in Florida. And that's what I did. And when I graduated, I sold my house and moved to North Carolina where I went to work for, uh, then it was Carl and Janice von Schumer, von, von Schumer. Um, wonderful, wonderful people. Um, if they're out there listening, God, I love you guys. They're wonderful people. They hired me at the BMW Motorcycles of Charlotte, now owned oh, by cool. Gail and Mark Engel. Yeah. Um, also wonderful people. Um, I was a technician there for a couple of years. Mark was kind enough to give me the opportunity to become service manager there, which really then kind of changed things for me because then I had a position that was more customer facing, right? Boy, you learn how to, you learn how to deal with customers at that point. And, and you deal with everything, the good and the bad, you have some wonderful, you know, dear, dear people, and you have other more challenging situations and you learn how to deal with those in, in a positive way. And once I was doing that, you know, then I actually got in contact with my liaison at BMW. And yeah. I, had, I had told that gentleman, I said, you know, if, if anything ever opens up at BMW uh, doing your position, uh, you know, I'd be very interested in that. And, you know, he stuck that in the back of his head. And darned if a year or two later, he came back to me and said, Sean, you know, there's a position opening up. I can't guarantee you anything, but you're welcome to apply for it. Yeah. And, I did apply for it, and lo and behold, I got the job at BMW. So I became that liaison that I wanted to do. That's awesome. And uh, I worked in a – they moved me to Ohio at that time, which was sort of my base, and I covered a certain area. It was the Mid-Atlantic. It was part of your region, Wes, because I used to call on Morton's, and that's where I first met George Mangiacaro. And so I sort of have have some, some ties to your stomping ground. And after a few years from that, um, I was fortunate enough to get uh, asked to come up to headquarters here in New Jersey to take on, uh, basically, I became the sort of the head technical guy at BMW. And I think about what a, you know, what a change from 2000 and uh, I quit my job in Nashville in 2000. And by 2007, I was the head technical dude at BMW, nice. <laughs> which was crazy. It sounds crazy. like a whirlwind. <laughs> it, it was a whirlwind. And, you know, I really worked hard. I really, I mean, I just lived and breathed motorcycles. And I still do. I mean, it's, it's, it's still my one pet. I haven't lost it. That's what I really, really love is, you know, people sometimes say, if you, if you take your hobby and turn it into a job, you kind of lose the passion for it. I've never lost it. I still, yeah. this is all I do. It's all I think about. I go home. Last night I was working in my garage, working on a bike. It's what I do. Yeah. So I've never lost it, you know, and I've been fortunate enough to have a, a few different positions in BMW. And, and as you may have mentioned at the, at the top here, I'm not the product and accessories manager. So it is, it's really given me a great opportunity to contribute in many different ways and meeting a lot of great people and obviously surrounded by wonderful products. So it's, it's been very, very rewarding for me. Yeah. It sounds like it, man. Yeah. And I, uh- Sean, and I really, I really appreciate your time and uh, coming on the show to talk about the CE04. Um, I'm su- super excited about BMW's future with electric motorcycles and the future of electric motorcycles in general. I mean, I'm just looking forward to it. Um, yeah. And I appreciate you shining some light on that for us, man. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Wes. And then once again, I, I appreciate the, you know you having me. I appreciate your articles and the BMW Owners News and Thank all your you. contributions. It, it's really, yeah, you know, you're really giving back to the sport, and I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. 
Visit our website at chasingthehorizon.us to listen to every episode of the podcast and read up on various motorcycle-related topics. The best way you can support Chasing the Horizon is by joining the BMW Motorcycle Owners of America. Yes, it says BMW right in the name, but we absolutely do not care what bike you ride. We know what's most important. The MOA is all about the community of riders, not a single brand. You can join as a digital member for $39 a year or as a traditional member for $49 a year. The biggest difference there is digital members don't get a hard copy of our monthly magazine in their mailbox. They access the BMW Owners News online. Each membership supports digital offerings like Chasing the Horizon, The Ride Inside with Mark Barnes, and everything else the MOA does. Find out more at bmwmoa.org. And ride along with us on the internet. Chasing the Horizon is on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. There's a mailing list with exclusive content and giveaways that are only open to subscribers. You can sign up for that at tinyletter.com slash chasing the horizon. We'll see you out there somewhere on the road or off it. Ride safe. <laughs>